I'm going to give you an um, uh, observational overview of FRBs, a, a quick one to trying to set the stage for the rest of the meeting, and then also an update uh, from the CHIME FRB project. So fast radio bursts, um, as uh, we all know, they're few millisecond long um, bursts of radio waves. The first example, of course, is the uh, now iconic uh, Lorimer burst uh, from 2007, where you can see um, the time uh, on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. You see the burst uh, sweep through the band. That's, that's some TV station or some interference or something at a fixed radio frequency. Uh, and when you correct for the dispersion, you get the inset there, which is uh, a burst of radio waves that uh, is not there initially. It appears and then disappears, and, and that has never been, that source has not been seen um, again. Uh, the dispersion measure, the, the size of that sweep, uh, is, um, uh, tells us that these fast radio bursts are uh, extragalactic because um, the value of the DM is much greater than anything the galaxy could provide. And uh, so generally now we know that the total d dispersion measure that you see in that sweep, in that one over frequency squared sweep, it, we believe is the sum of um, three, uh, and you could also argue four components, one due to the intervening Milky Way galaxy, and that's the term that doesn't, that, that you can never, uh, f defines FRBs in the sense of uh, if, um, if your total is greater than that green term over there, then it has to be extragalactic. Uh, uh, and then there's a term from the intergalactic medium, and then there's a term from the host galaxy, which could include the ISM of the host galaxy, um, analogous to what the Milky Way is providing, or it could be from the source, some, something in the immediate environment of the source. Um, now, this you might think that, oh, this burst, it's uh, you know, an anomaly, a strange thing, but in fact, the, the, these things are really common. So the, uh, and that's why I think that's one of the reasons they're so interesting. Uh, at 1.4 gigahertz for a rate, and, you, and here you should always, always specify the frequency and, and the threshold, because those are crucial in, in saying what the rate is. Roughly speaking, about 600 per day uh, is thought to be the rate. So this is not something uncommon. This is something the universe loves to do. Uh, it was a surprise, and um, uh, it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, um, I think that's, uh, that's particularly interesting. And I'll just mention um, there's been some evidence for galactic latitude dependence of the um, observed rate, but I think that's uh, still under discussion. Um, and I should also point you to some uh, two excellent recent reviews that uh, uh, will do a far better job than I will uh, because uh, it's very lengthy reviews. Uh, so if you want more information, see those papers. So one of the, you know, there's all sorts of things to describe about FRBs. I'll start out with one that I think is, is very interesting. Um, some of them do repeat. So unlike that Lorimer burst, which nobody's ever seen again, some of them uh, repeat. Um, the first one was uh, 121102, FRB 121102, about which the, the very next talk uh, by uh, uh, Laura Spittler uh, will be focused. Uh, the second you see that I think this is interesting because, oh, it's like, uh, you know, constraining models in, in an instant. Um, it rules out cataclysmic models for um, this kind of source. You could see here now these, these, uh, the dispersion has been removed from them. Uh, this is a, a set of pulses from uh, Arecibo, uh, where you can see um, now some phenomenology that is, seems to be common, um, certainly to repeaters, but also to other apparent non-repeaters. Uh, of course, now you can never know what's a repeater, what isn't, because it might eventually repeat. But in any case, you see some uh, broad pulses, uh, some uh, you know, uh, multi-component pulses, uh, and the other thing to notice is the uh, radically different spectra. So you see some of them. Um, now, there's all sorts of beam effects going on. I'm going to come back to that. It'll be a bit of a theme, especially when we talk about, ch when we talk about chime. Um, but you see there's a variety of burst morphology spectra. Uh, some are band limited. So if we, you know, a lot of people like to model FRBs as power laws in, in some band. But, you know, when you look at this, you say, oh, power law, I'm not sure that's the right parameterization. Uh, and moreover, for at least certainly this repeater, and I'll talk a little bit 
more later about uh, another repeater. Bursts are clearly clustered in, uh, in time, so they're not, not a Poissonian process. And for other repeaters, and, and today there's uh, 20 of these known, um, uh, 20 repeaters in the literature, they, um, most of them don't have enough bursts to be able to say with any certainty whether or not they're Poissonian. Uh, but certainly for this one and for at least one other, um, uh, th there's definite clustering. Uh, so, you know, just the phenomenology and saying, oh, it's a source that can repeat and it can flip its spectrum and it can have all these different uh, morphologies, that's all very quite interesting. But apart from that, it also does something very important, which is um, it, enables, um, it, it enables localization. Uh, n not that some, some telescopes, and we'll hear about that, like ASCAP, can localize in real time, but for um, uh, repeaters, this uh, repeating, as long as you're patient, you're, you can go to an interferometer and then go and look, and I'll talk about that shortly. But as an overview, um, uh, so just about burst morphology, so just going through different um, aspects of the phenomenon. Uh, so most FRBs, I think it's fair to say, show single peaked pulses. Um, like this one from Thornton et al., just a single peak. Some of them, and it's yet unclear what fraction, show scatter broadening also as seen in this peak. And for those of you not familiar, this is manifest as a frequency dependent, um, you know, uh, con uh, convolved, uh, frequency dependent um, uh, exponential that's been convolved with a, you know, Gaussian. That's how it's typically modeled. It might, modeled, it might not exactly be that. But where the, Scattering time is proportional to f to roughly the minus four power. It's not not necessarily exactly four, but that's that's roughly that. So very strong frequency dependence, uh, and the scattering uh, this comes from multipath scattering in the along the direction of propagation. Uh, you know th that and the dispersion measure have imprinted on this source uh, a history or some information about its propagation to us from the host, right through perhaps intervening galaxy halos, um, all the way uh, to the IGM and then to our, um, uh, to our galaxy. So unlike gamma ray bursts, where you don't have that stuff, you have a lot, there's a lot of information encoded in fast radio burst uh, profiles uh, that, that's, that's quite interesting, and I think it's going to be a treasure trove for years to come, trying to sort that out. Um, on the other hand, you also saw that, uh, for example, in 121102, some of the bursts are multi-peaked and uh, have complex morphologies, and it's, it is sometimes uh, hard to distinguish, you know, complicated morphology from scattering, um, particularly if you don't have a wide bandwidth or if your source is itself band-limited. This is actually something we're struggling with a little bit uh, with Chime RBs, I'll, I'll show. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you distinguish complex morphology from scattering? And moreover, uh, it's uh, when you have complex morphology, it's not, not so obvious in this burst. I'll sh I, might, I think I'll show others um, where it'll be obvious. Uh, it, it suddenly makes you wonder exactly how it's best to dis define dispersion measures. So you think of a one over frequency squared um, uh, delay, uh, but uh, how do you optimize for that dispersion measure? It's a very interesting problem. You think, oh, just optimize for signal strength. Well, it's not necessarily the right way to do it. Sometimes um, that doesn't work, and, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, FRB burst properties, uh, spectra. So the Lorimer burst sort of was a little, you know, it was truly broadband, and that was over, if you didn't notice, 300 megahertz, a very, you know, no sign of uh, much fading, but uh, others are not. Um, that is, they have these knotty kind of spectra where you see de definite variations in radio frequency. And notice the different size of the band here. This is from um, utmost, where you, uh, the, the band is, uh, is narrower, but nevertheless, you see um, clear variations in the spectra. And on top of it, I showed you the band, some band-limited um, events from um, 12.11.02. Um, and, you know, you can see it even more so in this, uh, in another montage of a set of 121102 bursts. Uh, I, I don't want to dwell on it too much because Laura's going to talk about it, but um, in some of these events, you also see the spectra uh, of, sub uh, of, um, 
uh, uh, bursts, subbursts that are time ordered uh, going downward in frequency. And that's the sort of, we, uh, I don't know who coined this, it's brilliant whoever coined it, the sad trombone morphology. It's like uh, wah, wah, wah. And the, uh, so you see that actually fairly commonly, and uh, we, and I'll show you, we've seen it in, in other repeater bursts. Um, uh, and in bright sources, um, you can also see uh, diffractive scintillation, which is telling you, again, about that's, that's another, another imprint of the uh, propagation of the source, which you know, has a lot of information. Um, yeah, and so we'll see Laura's talk shortly. So the repeating nature of 12.11.02, so now I want to talk about localizations. Um, so the repeating nature of 12.11.02, as I said, uh, allowed um, uh, the, you, we could introduce an interferometer to the problem, and it required some patience because the bursts don't always cooperate, so you can sit there for hours and not see anything. In fact, in this case, I, I, there were many months went from the first observation to when it was actually seen to repeat, but with the VLA, um, uh, Xiaomi et al. Uh, localized 12.11.02 by detecting um, a whole bunch of bursts. And uh, if this was the, uh, you know, if 12.11.02 was found at Arecibo, this was the Arecibo circles, uh, the, the VLA could then uh, pinpoint exactly where in the large error circles from the single dish radio telescope, because it's an inter interferometer, it could pinpoint it uh, very precisely. And then you could go to uh, uh, an optical telescope like Gemini uh, to see what's there. And this was the first, first time we could look and see, um, uh, is there a galaxy there? How far away is the galaxy? What kind of galaxy? And it turned out, uh, I think it was pretty surprising, it was a, a dwarf galaxy at a redshift of about 0.2. So the redshift was not actually um, a surprise. That was roughly what was expected. Uh, it confirmed the cosmological uh, distance as inferred from the uh, dispersion measure. Um, also coincident with the, with the uh, FRB is a continuum radio source. So you could see the, the flux from the continuum radio source over here, uh, variable, so it's variable, but not, so the, the red points are when the uh, FRB had its bursts, and you can see that the variation doesn't, doesn't seem to, the variation in the continuum radio source doesn't seem to know much about those bursts, which is sort of curious. Um, so, you know, this, that, this variation could be a propagation effect also of that source. We're not really sure at this point. Um, and then you can, once you have you know, that, you can go further with uh, VLBI, uh, the European VL VLBI network and the VLBA, to show uh, that that FRB is not, at, not merely in a dwarf galaxy, but off-center from the dwarf galaxy in a star formation knot, um, which you know, right away suggests youth, and you think, ah, this has got to be a young object, but I want to get into models, because you're all theorists, and we're going to hear a lot about that. Uh, and then, of course, it's intriguing that some superluminous supernovae are also in uh, star formation regions of dwarf galaxies. That's sort of intriguing. Uh, but in the last uh, year or so, there's been four more localizations, very exciting, uh, lots of wonderful work going on, and uh, really none of them is in a dwarf galaxy, so I don't know what that means, but... But uh, so for, for Bannister at all, you can see it's sort of a uh, kind of a elliptical type galaxy. It's a, a little bit offset. So in this case, the, the position is known to be here. Uh, Ravi at all. Um, uh, the error region's a little large, uh, uh, but, but probably it's associated with, with uh, this uh, source here. This is at, at redshift uh, 0.66. This is the redshift 0.32. You know, all cosmological, no question about this. Uh, Prochaska at all. Uh, find the FRB coincident with a galaxy and with a foreground galaxy in front. So that, that presents a really nice opportunity to, to study the uh, content of the, of the foreground galaxy halo as well. And then uh, just, a couple, just, I think, two, a couple weeks ago, uh, another FRB, one of the CHIME FRBs, uh, was localized using VLBI uh, to be on the outskirts of this elliptical galaxy at redshift. This one's really close, at redshift 0.03. Uh, so just a scorecard for the moment, five localizations. Um, the, I put it in red. That's a, this one's a repeater. The rest are not known to be repeaters. They might turn out to be repeaters, but they're not for the moment. Sort of interesting that the two repeaters are in young type environments, and the others that are thus far non-repeaters 
are kind of you know older type, maybe elliptical, maybe they're not all exactly elliptical galaxies, but older type environments. But it's it's really small number statistics, and I, I wouldn't draw too much. And then very late last night, I was so curious about this because I hadn't seen this plot. Um, I, I, you can just uh, rudimentary P, uh, Python plotting skills. But um, <coughs> the, this is the excess DM um, and, and redshift versus excess DM because one interesting question is, um, is excess DM, that when I say excess, I mean subtracting off the Milky Way component, is that uh, correlated with uh, redshift? Because that would say that your dispersion measure is really dominated by the IGM and, and not by the host. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be the host contributes a lot. In fact, for 12.11.02, uh, the host contributes about a third of the dispersion measure. Uh, and then I took off, so I took off the NE2000 ga galaxy. I took off 50 for the halo. I took off 100 for the host, which, of course, is totally ad hoc. I, don't, I can't justify that, but just for fun. And then chi by i, uh, that's DM 870, is 875 times the redshift. Uh, that's sort of interesting, uh, but, uh, of course, it's... It's early days, and one needs more localizations, and maybe uh, there'll be there's a talk by ASCAP. Uh, who knows what they'll show? I don't know anything. I'm just I was kidding around. I yeah. Uh, I don't. Yes, I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Okay. Um, scattering. Very quick. How much? Okay. Uh, scattering. Um, as I said, some FRB shows clear scattering tails. Um, yeah, so this is a plot now of dispersion measure. And here, the, the, the excess is not removed. So this is the total dispersion measure. And you could argue it should be the excess. But it's the same for all FRBs here. And this is scattering time. And you always have to say, if you say scattering time, you have to say, oh, at what frequency? Because scattering is very <laughs> frequency dependent. As you said, this is at referred to 1 gigahertz. Uh, so the black dots are galactic radio pulsars, where you see a, a, a clear correlation. Uh, lots of scatter about that correlation. This is a log-log plot over many orders. Uh, but nevertheless, there, there is a clear correlation. Uh, the 1.4 gigahertz points are from the FRB cat, uh, where the triangles are upper limits. And the red points are um, uh, the first 13 chime FRB uh, events. I'll, I'm going to add to this plot shortly. Um, but uh, you can see that, you know, it, it, it's not so obvious at the moment what's going on there. It, it may be a hint of a, a little bit of a correlation, which you, you might expect uh, if, you know, going through, if, if the, IG, if the uh, DM is IGM dominated, you go through a lot of halos, uh, you might, and halos cause scattering, or you might expect it if the in local environment contributes a lot of dispersion measure and a lot of scattering. Um, you know, there's lots of ways you, you, you might expect it, but it's not really obvious in this plot. And, and just to point out, and I want to start pointing out biases, because that is a big part of the FRB game that we all have to understand. Uh, you might say, oh, how come all the chime events are less scattered than the 1.4 gigahertz events? The scattering times are so much lower. And, of course, the reason is because chime uh, can only measure those values. If you, look, if you, you consider a, a 10 millisecond burst at 1 gigahertz, at 1.4 gigahertz, the width there is 2.6 milliseconds, which is very measurable. But in the chime band, it's 77 milliseconds, which we would have a very hard time detecting. We, we could, if it was bright, we'd find it. But um, there's a huge bias against finding. Uh, so, so events like these over here, we're not going to see with chime, or we'll have a harder time. So there's a huge amount of bias in this plot that's very important to understand. Polarization, and um, I think Manisha is going to be talking all about polarization. And I'm running out of time, so I'm, I might just skip it, except to give you the, the Reader's Digest version for those of you who remember that publication. It's, it's just a real short summary. It's a mixed bag. Um, of the 109 reported FRBs in the catalog, 11 have reported rotation measures. Um, 11, and not the same ones, which puzzles me, but anyway, 11 have reported percent linear polarizations, and I've given you the ranges. You know, they range from 0 to 200, with one exception, as I'll say in a second, and then from 0 to 100 in terms of polarization. Some are not at all polarized. Some are 100% polarized. Some show circular polarization. Many show no polarization. Uh, many of the rotation measures are consistent with the Milky Way values. Some are a little higher. Uh, but one is definitely not. Uh, and uh, I guess Laura's going to talk about it. I'm running out of time. But... Um, uh, 
that's about uh, 10 to the 5 for the repeating FRB 121102. Shocking value uh, among the highest rotation measures ever measured for an astronomical source. And once corrected, you can see uh, all sorts of very fine features at 30 microseconds. Um, if it's generic, then some of the unpolar, if it's such a high uh, rotation measure were generic, then some of the unpolarized FRBs might merely be depolarized, like uh, perhaps the, uh, the, the channel bandwidth was too large to detect such a high rotation measure. But I think it, the, we're coming to the conclusion it's not at all generic, even to the repeaters. Uh, the Chime FRB collaboration has now f measured rotation measures for, for three other repeaters, and in no case is it anywhere near as high. Um, you can see the value here. This is work by a grad student, Ryan McKinvin. Um, <clears throat> so 12.1102 seems so far to be unusual. I'm going to skip that. Uh, okay, so I was supposed to spend half my time on a review and half my time on Chime, so I've, I'm running out of time. <sighs> So CHIME is a radio telescope in Penticton, British Columbia, made of four uh, stationary cylinders that are 20 meters by 100 meters, an area of five hockey arenas and Canadian units. Uh, <coughs> it's a transit telescope that is oriented north-south, so the sky rotates overhead, and on each of these cylindrical axes there's 256 dual, polarized, dual linear polarization antennas that uh, are all combined and put into a massive correlator that is sitting in these large uh, shipping containers that are over here, and the FRB searching is done in that shipping container. We operate from 400 to 800 megahertz, and just to set the scale, you could see the CHIME team standing on one of the axes over there. Uh, CHIME was built and designed to do a cosmology experiment. Uh, the signals all come down to huts that are underneath the dishes that have a part of the correlator that does the uh, time-to-frequency uh, transform, and then another part of the correlator that's in the shipping container. And then the same data go to three different experiments, um, one of which is the FRB, and the other is uh, actually um, mapping um, neutral hydrogen and high redshift. Um, in the correlator, we form out of all of those uh, antennas um, 1,024 digital beams on the sky. Um, so the width here, depending on frequency, is about two degrees, but we go north-south 120 degrees. Uh, the beams have interesting shapes, interesting responses, which are highly declination dependent. I'm saying that, I'm emphasizing this for a purpose, so you understand what we're, what we're dealing with here. Uh, but we have a very wide field of view, so we can detect them uh, fairly efficiently. Uh, you can see, uh, so all of this, uh, yeah, whoopsie, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip the whole detection thing because I'm truly running out of time and I want to show you the science stuff. Uh, this is a chime view of the sky. This is how we look at it. This is time on the x-axis. This is north-south beam um, on the y-axis. Uh, these are pulsars. So pulsars in time traverse through the primary beam at fixed declination, so north-south beam is equivalent to declination, so these are uh, pulsars. This is a very bright pulsar, 0329 plus 54. It was sort of cool at first. So, wow, we could see it for four hours, and then you realize that's actually not so cool. Um, uh, so we uh, showed FRBs uh, go down to 400 megahertz. That was the first result where you, uh, first 13 events um, from last year, and you can see some of them go right down to the bottom, uh, 400 megahertz, we, all sorts of interesting uh, morphologies and um, interesting question. Gee, it, it cuts off there. Are there events below 400? We can't answer that. Uh, Chime also found the second repeater, um, and you can see uh, some of the interesting morphology with the sad trombone. Again, just like in 121102, very reminiscent of it. Um, in fact, we did detect 121102. Uh, you can now just. I'm showing you this partly. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting that we've only seen one burst from it so far, um, but this is a nice plot made by Alex Josephi, who's here, he's our localization guru. Um, and you can see how things traverse the sky through the beams. We know 12 of, of an, uh, two's position, so we know exactly where in the beam it goes off and the event happened over there. Uh, and you see there's a certain beam response um, that is specific to this location that you have to understand when you're interpreting these spectra. So this is just different ways of de-dispersing the same burst. The top um, 
that's actually from the Chime Pulsar instrument. Uh, but these, um, you, what I want to show you here is these huge spectral variations. This is not bandpass calibrated. And what you see is we have enormous spectral uh, change, sens changes in sensitivity across the bandpass. Um, so this is entirely bandpass related. <clears throat> we try and calibrate it out, but keep in mind every single one of those 1,024 beams has a different spectral response that has to be calibrated. It's a transit telescope. We cannot just put a source there to calibrate it. It is very challenging. Um, we then found eight more uh, repeaters. Um, uh, eight more repeaters, variety of morphologies, um, interesting uh, structure, interesting spectral response, but again, always folded in with the chime response, which we are working on. Uh, complex morphologies, it makes morphological characteristic challenging, uh, characterizations very challenging. How best to de-disperse? Um, and um, I've already emphasized that this is something that we're, we struggle with, and I guess a lot of you do too. Um, and then we found some more repeaters. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about the repeaters is how um, if you plot the burst widths of the repeaters, this is pulse width now, and there's a histogram, uh, and then you plot the, at least the 12 non-repeating sources that, that we published, um, you can see that it, it, there's evidence that the um, uh, repeaters uh, have wider bursts. Why that is, I don't know, but this is an observational or overview, I'm telling you, uh, this. Um, a return to the scattering versus DM plot. Again, this is total DM. I've now plotted the Chime FRB repeaters on top of this. Uh, again, the plot is heavily biased. We also would have, uh, just if you just only pay attention to Chime, we'd have a very hard time finding higher, you know, we, we have a bias against finding highly scattered pulses. Uh, nevertheless, you know, I don't know, is it interesting that these are a little higher at high DM than these? Uh, not so clear. There's, Burst morphology is very much intertwined with all of this, and we're trying to sort, sort that out. Very recently, we reported that one of our repeaters, one of the most prolific of the repeaters, um, shows periodic activity. Uh, so this is, uh, we've taken uh, all the bursts, I think in this case there were 28 bursts, 27 bursts, um, and uh, this is a periodogram where you can see uh, clear periodicity at 16.3 days and harmonics. Uh, we have checked to verify that the source exposure does not contribute to this. This is if you take random events that suffered the same exposure as this source. Uh, and also a pulsar nearby on the sky. Uh, radio pulsar does not show any of these and there's other pulsars at all. Nothing else shows this periodicity, only the source. And this plot is a very nice one where you can see in black all of the exposure that we had to it. Very nice plot by Pragya, who's, I don't know where Pragya is, there's Pragya. A uh, beautiful plot, because it just shows you we have tons of exposure here, but we only ever see the burster uh, every 16 days. Now, some cycles, we do have some exposure. That's not a good example. Here's a good example. We have excellent exposure, but no bursts. So it's not there at every cycle, but it only appears within this four-day window. Um, so plot here by... Uh, a uh, bunch of students, including Ziggy Plinus, who's somewhere in the audience. I don't know. There is Ziggy right in the middle. Um, you can see that it doesn't seem to be any fluence correlation with phase in this 16-day uh, uh, cycle. Uh, the dispersion measure, uh, if you look at the red points, those are the most important ones. They're from baseband data where we um, can measure it really well, very, you know, very constant as far as we can tell. Um, and so uh, what is it? Uh, we'll probably discuss it. I'm running out of time. So I, I, you know, there's all sorts of things it could be, but we don't know. And I hope you'll tell us. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit more. I have 44 seconds. OK. Uh, we're trying to catalog a lot of bursters at the moment. We, uh, are, this is what we are doing. If we weren't distracted by that uh, periodicity, we would have been doing a lot uh, this. Um, a huge amount, but basically, the localization of our bursts is non-trivial. The fluence is non uh, measuring fluences is non-trivial. Morphologies are non-trivial. Um, I want you to note this plot that was published in a repeater paper made by Alex Josephi. Note the complexity here. It is really hard, you know, get, getting these localizations right is not easy. And if we want to publish 
you know, hundreds of these. Each one, we have to be sure, you know, we don't want to give you people wrong coordinates, and we don't want to give people wrong fluences. Essential to publishing is getting this stuff right, and we are working on it. And I want to show you very quickly one chime FRB out of hundreds and uh, three different views. In one beam, broadband. In one beam, narrowband. It's the same event seen in these three different... And in one beam, oh, it just sneaks in a, a little bit there. So if this event had happened like over here, we would only see this view of it. That's sobering. There's a lot of information encoded here. We have to know each, ba each beam of 1,024 beams very precisely. This is non-trivial work, and we are working hard trying to get this done for the community to tell you. But let me give you a few things that I can show you with certainty. Uh, RA deck plot, they're all over the sky. The red ones are repeaters. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm way, I don't, I lost track of where I am, I'm sorry. Okay, so I will just uh, say our exposure is complex. Prague is working on that. Uh, we have, okay, we have an upper transit and a lower transit. And uh, I'll show you, so, uh, one plot that you probably haven't seen yet is uh, uh, DM dispersion, uh, interesting dispersion, DM dispersion, and, um, but it is totally uncorrected, this plot for chime FRB detection biases. So you see that it falls off with dispersion measure, but we don't know if this fall off is due to our sensitivity falling off or not. So you shouldn't read too much into this. We, we do have sensitivity out here, absolutely. So it's definitely falling off, but I don't know how fast. Uh, and we are currently determining our bias, biases. We've set up a real-time injection pipeline where we are injecting these things and, uh, into the, uh, into the um, uh, real data stream. Okay, conclusions. FRBs are interesting. I don't think I have to tell you that. Uh, but the story is developing rapidly. Like, I learned so much just preparing this paper last night, reading all your papers. There's un unbelievable work going on in the community. There's so much more to do. And I will stop there. I'm looking forward to the rest of the workshop. Thank you.